I think it's true to say that every generation has them. Uh, wherever you go in the world, wherever, whatever time in history you're in, there are stories like the one that we've read, David and Goliath stories. We're continuing our series, A Man After God's Own Heart, looking at the life of David. And this story, perhaps more than any other, is the famous one. This is the one that people remember. This is the one, if you don't know any other story in the Old Testament, you'll know this one. And it's so popular, it infiltrates all of our culture. If you just type the words David and Goliath into Google or into the Times web website or the Guardian or the Independent, you'll find story after story popping up about this idea, this metaphor. For example, let's have a little look. Uh, do you remember David Hay, not David Hayes, David Hay, a couple of uh, weeks ago, sorry, a couple of years ago, fighting this monster of a Russian, and he defeated him. He was seven foot something, uh, looked absolutely terrifying, and he defeated him to win the title. In the news recently, uh, this big rock, Gibraltar, has been described as a David to the Goliath of Spain, as people have talked about sovereignty and all those kinds of things. We could use the example, perhaps not a good one, of Bournemouth against Real Madrid. Didn't work out quite as a David and Goliath story, did it? But never mind. And you may not realize it, but in Bournemouth, sorry, not Bournemouth, in Dorset tonight, one of the great David and Goliath stories of our generation is playing itself out. It's the almighty battle of Tesco versus Sherborne. Have you heard about this? It's made the national press. Sherborne do not want a Tesco, and they are fighting. They have a song, actually. Um, I was going to burn it onto a DVD and play it to you. You might thank me, me for not doing that, but you can check on YouTube if you want. No thanks, Tesco, Sherborne. Put it into YouTube. Uh, you'll have a treat there. It's, uh, it's about four minutes long, so maybe a little bit long, but it might stir you to fight for the cause. But we see these stories everywhere. David versus Goliath, the giant versus the boy, underdog stories. And I think the problem I have as a preacher, and maybe the problem you have this evening sitting there listening to this, is that we know it so well. Since you were probably this high, you've been coloring in pictures of David, doing the, the blood splurging out of Goliath's head. You've watched kind of ropey animations on VHSs of the story played out. You know the story really, really well. And so to hear another sermon feels like a bit of a waste of 25 minutes, half an hour of your life. But I think that as we look at this passage, we'll see that it's more than just another underdog story. The story of David and Goliath isn't just to kind of give a pep talk to the people of Sherborne that they might just beat Tesco, the mighty Goliath. It is not something which might have been read out in the dressing room of AFC Bournemouth. I know actually Andy Rimmer, who's the, the chaplain there, and if you read it there, it, it made no difference, did it? But this story is more than just... The boy beats the giant. It's more than just reach for the sky, punch above your weight in David Hayes' case. It's something far more. So, so stick with it. If you're thinking yawn because you've just heard it's a story that you've heard a thousand times before, then stick with it. This story has more to give than just that. And so let's have a look at it together. And let's look where it begins. Thank you, Josh, for reading it so well to us. And we started off at the beginning with uh, uh, two armies, one on each hill. We've got the Philistines on one side. We have the Israelites on the other side. And amongst, um, in between them is a valley. And the reason they're on a hill, each of them, is because in a war, you never want to be fighting the uphill battle. You know that phrase? Well, it's literally true, isn't it, in war? If you make the first advance, then you have to work up the hill to fight the people on top of the hill, which is never a good place to be. And so each of these two nations are, are ready for battle, but they don't want to be the person who makes the first move. It could also be, interestingly, that the people who are the Philistines don't want to fight the Israelites in the hills because they thought actually you, you can read it in two kings they thought that Yahweh was the god of the hills they thought that he fought better in the hill country whereas their god was the god of the plains but for one reason or another they don't want to fight in the hills and so they have a clever plan it's an unusual plan actually what they want to do is put one man from the philistines against one man from the israelites to have a one-on-one -on -one combat and this one man from the philistines will represent the whole nation and the one man from the Israelites will represent all of them. And whoever wins, wins the battle. That's it. I guess they could have played chess or conquers or flipped a coin or something, but everyone's ready for a fight, so they're going to have a fight. And they get their man. His name is Goliath. And the coincidence is that he is uh, nine feet tall, so he's the one to, uh, to go for them. And we read a bit about him here. We can see this guy, not only was he over nine feet tall, but he was covered in armor. He had this sort of chain mail that weighed more than I do. And he had that around his shoulders. He had these greaves, these things on his kind of shin pads. And that's useful if everyone else comes up to your waist. You want to protect your legs, don't you? And he had a man who ran ahead of him who held his shield. This is hardly fair, was it? He had a spear. 
And the point of the spear was 14 pounds. Sometimes you read stuff in shekels and you don't really know what it means. It's quite a lot. If you imagine an Olympic shot put, do you know how much that is? 12 pounds. This is more than a shot put, made sharp on the end of a stick, and he's going to throw it at your head. And he's nine foot tall, and he has a man in front of him with a shield and armor that weighs more than me. And he wants a fight. And so you can imagine that as the Israelites were seeing this, they weren't really keen. Do you, do you notice how many column inches he gets? He gets right from verse 4 all the way down to verse 11, describing this monster of a man, this giant, who's ready to rip them limb from limb, together with his little assistant with the shield. And it wasn't just what he looked like that they described, but the historian here describes what he says as well. So if you've got your Bible open at chapter 17 in 1 Samuel, have a look with me at verse 8. We're going to hear what Goliath said, and this is important. If we miss this, we'll miss the whole point of the story. Verse 8. Goliath stood and he shouted at the ranks of Israel, Why do you come up and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. What do you think happened? Well, verse 11 explains it pretty clearly. On hearing this, uh, the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Who's going to fight him? Well, the obvious choice would be Saul, wouldn't it? He's the king. They've picked him to be in charge of them. I mean, if, if you'd like to, if you've got the, uh, your, your Bible open in chapter, eight, turn, uh, sorry, in chapter 17, just turn back to chapter 8 of the same book with me. And, and in chapter 8, we, we read all about the selection of a king. Why do they want a king? They had God as their king. He was in charge of the nation. But, but the Israelites say this, chapter 8, verse 19. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. He thought it was a good idea to keep God as the king. And I think with hindsight, we can agree with him. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we shall be like the other nations, with a king to lead us and to go out before us and to fight our battles. That's what they wanted. And they found Saul, and he was a good candidate. He was head and shoulders above anyone else in Israel. He's a big bloke. He wasn't nine foot tall, but he wasn't small. He'd stand out in a crowd. And, and so he's the obvious choice. But right here, he is absolutely terrified. And he's looking for any excuse not to go out to battle. We'll see later. He, he tries to bribe other people to go in his place. Anyway, that's scene number one. That's on the battlefield. And we're going to go ten miles down the road now to Bethlehem, to the second scene. And what we find there is David. Now... We had him introduced to us last week by Peter. And at this point, no one really gets David. No one realizes he's anything special. And he's at home. He's the youngest of eight kids. Uh, and his three oldest brothers are actually in the army um, over in the Valley of Elah. And I don't know what the other brothers are doing. But anyway, the three oldest are in the army. He's the youngest, and he's at home looking after the sheep. And his dad sends him with a packed lunch uh, to try and find out how the older brothers are doing and some cheese for the commanding officer. I'm not sure what that's about. But back then, if you wanted to impress a commanding officer, you sent 10 bits of cheese. So he does anyway. And David goes with the cheese and the packed lunch and all the other stuff, and he heads off uh, to go and see what's going on here, to get a message from the older brothers and to deliver the lunch. And he, and he arrives on the scene, and what does he see? Well, you can imagine this boy. Well boy teenager. If he was 20, he would have joined the army, so he's younger than that. But he also says that he, he fights wild animals and he kills them, so he's no six-year-old. It's not like the, the Sunday school pictures you see. So maybe a 17, 18-year-old um, guy. And he heads off, and maybe for the first time he goes over this hilly country, comes to the brow of this hill and sees before him thousands upon thousands of soldiers. He sees the army, and, and like any boy of his age or man of his age, however you want to describe him, he wants to see more. So he, he goes down the hill and he finds himself amongst the troops, just as Goliath's about to set foot on the scene. Let's see what he says. Um, David leaves his stuff in verse 22 with the guy who's in charge of stuff, and he heads down to the battlefield. Verse 25. Now the Israelites have been saying, so actually, no, let's go from verse 23. As he was talking to them, Goliath, the Philistine, champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. Now the Israelites have been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He, he's coming out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him, and he will also give him his daughter in marriage, 
and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. Now what happens there I think is a, a crucial turning point in the story. David arrives on the scene. He, he's milling around with the other soldiers, with his older brothers, with other people, ready for battle. And then Goliath steps out. And in David's reaction, in everyone else's reaction as well, you see the difference. And the difference is faith. As, as Goliath steps out, David hears him. And we'll come back to that in a moment. But what does everyone else do? They run for cover. And David's kind of in a crowd. And then one moment later, he's just surrounded by kind of their dust. And he's on his own, listening to what this man has to say. This man who for over a month has come out day after day and defied God. And I think in that moment, as David heard those words, he knew what he had to do. In that moment, I think he had decided already how this day would pan out. He didn't realize it was going to be like that when he woke up that morning. He thought he was delivering grain and cheese and stuff and finding out how his brothers were doing. But he realizes now that this day is going to be quite a different day. He hears what Goliath says. So he asks a bit about this kind of package of um, things which will happen, the bri uh, bribes which will happen for people who stand up and fight Goliath. And he discovers there's a tax break. He finds out there's some um, extra money which he'll get, some wealth, and he'll get to marry the king's daughter. So it looks pretty good. But that hadn't enticed anyone else. There's something different about David. And you know what I think it is? The different thing about David is his faith, his belief in God. And you know, I think he asks the question, and we'll come to that in just a moment. You see, he is not the obvious person to fight this battle. And we see that from everyone else's reactions. His older brother is not appreciative of this. David, I think, in his mind has decided he will fight. But, but what does Eliab say? Eliab, his older brother, has a go at him, like he probably always did. Older brothers are like that, aren't they? I, I'm blessed not to have an older brother, but some of you all have one, and I feel for you, and all of Josh's younger siblings. Never mind. But um, his, his, his older brother, Eliab, is not happy about this. Why have you come down here? You just want to see the, the carnage. You just want to see a bit of blood and guts. You're just here to, to watch and to, to, to see what's going on in the battlefield. And David responds like any younger sibling would do. Look at verse 29. Hear the teenager in your, in your mind here. Now what have I done? Says, sorry, I had to turn my page. Says David, can't I even speak? Doesn't it sound like a teenager? And David, in his teenage voice, says, oh, come on, Eliab, give me a break. I've just come here to do what Dad told me to do. It's not my fault. Anyway, Eliab doesn't see the potential in David. He doesn't see anything different in him. And then he goes to Saul. Saul, the king, hears that there's actually someone insane enough to fight against Goliath. So he calls him along. And Saul doesn't see it either. He says, you're just a boy. You're a little kid. This guy is nine foot tall. He's been a, a warrior since he was about seven years old. He's, he's absolutely going to rip you to pieces. Saul doesn't see the potential there. But David sees things slightly differently. Look at verse 34 with me. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. Struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Do you see what David sees? Do you see the difference in David's perspective on this, on this scene which is ahead of him. Everyone else saw a big, scary, hairy, nine-foot man shouting with a big shot put sharpened on the end of a stick he was going to throw it at them. That's what they saw. David sees all of that, but he also realizes, and he asks the question, hold on a minute, isn't our God alive? Isn't our God the Lord? Isn't he the king? Isn't he the true God? Doesn't that make a difference? Doesn't that change things slightly? He might be nine foot tall, but our God created everything. Our God is the king. He reigns. Surely, has, has everyone forgotten this? Do you get David's reasoning there? And if God is on our side, then, then surely that changes things just slightly. Come on. It, I may be a boy. He may be nine foot tall, but, but God is on our side. And, and I think in David's questions and in David's words here, we also see the absolute outrage at what this man is doing. We'll mention it maybe in a minute, perhaps we'll mention it now, that in those days, war and the power of your God were, were intricately linked. If you, if you were successful in war, it meant that your God was powerful. If you lost battles, it meant your God was nothing, that he lacked power. 
and by Goliath standing up and declaring so confidently that he could win this battle, hands down, no matter who they put against him. He's making a statement about their God, and David doesn't like that for one minute. He asks the question, what about the living God? And David knows that in the past God has helped him, and he is confident that he'll help him again today. And so we know the rest of the story. I think at this point, David has really wrapped up this story. The rest of it's a footnote. The rest of it's details. You know what happens. He collects the stones. He goes to battle. Goliath takes one step. He runs towards him. He swings his sling. He lets go of the stone. It hits him in the forehead. Goliath goes down. He chops his head off. The Philistines run away. The Israelites pursue them. They have a victory. What, three minutes flat and the whole thing's over? That's it. It was one, the moment that David realized what other people missed, that they had the living God on their side. That's what made the difference. The rest of it, that's just details. And the story is over. Now, we know this story. We're familiar with this story. Israel win. Everyone shouts for joy. Everyone cheers. They sing songs to David. He's become this kind of pinup. You can see in chapter 18, the women love him. He was a bit of a pretty boy. He now is a giant slayer. He also has a record deal with the king. So he kind of ticks all the boxes. And the women are like, woo, David, uh, Saul has slain his thousands. David his tens of thousands. They love him. It doesn't translate very well and keep the meter, but I'm sure it would have been a nice song. And they, they sing about him and they love him. David's the hero. But is it just another dragon slayer story? Is it just another... Um, boy beats the giant story? Is it just another underdog story to pep up AFC Bournemouth before a match? Is it just another underdog story to give the people of um, Sher... Where was it? Sher... I was somewhere in Dorset. Anyway, the, the, the guts to go up against Tesco. Is that what it was? I think it's far more. What does this story tell us? It's not just morals. It's not just be like David, be brave. It's not just go on, fight against the bully. This doesn't give you legitimate reasons to go into work tomorrow morning and punch your boss in the face if he's an idiot. You can't do that based on this passage. It doesn't give you a reason to go in on September and decapitate the bully in your school. That's not what this passage is saying. And more seriously, actually, the violence in this passage worries people, I think. Some people look at this and they think, okay, there's more of that bloodthirsty Old Testament stuff. There's a few reasons why we cannot go near the violence. Uh, firstly, their, their scenario politically is very different to ours. Never again will there be a situation like this where they had what we call a theocracy. It means that God's in charge of the country. That a whole nation can claim that they are the lords and that he is their king. That's not our situation. That's not America's situation. That's not the situation of any country these days. So we can't do what they did. Also, as we've mentioned before, war and the success of your God were, were, were intricately, intricately linked. If you lost in battle, your God was weak. That was the assumption. That's not really our situation either, is it? Also, I think we have to take note of the most significant battle that God ever won. And it was there that the victory was won with submission and with sacrifice, not with weapons of war. That's got to inform us too, hasn't it? So if this isn't telling us to punch your boss in the face, if this isn't telling us to chop the head off the bully in your school, what's it telling us to do? Are we supposed to follow David's example in any way? I think we are. I don't think this is just, um, I think this is more than just that. And what I'd like us to look at is this phrase which I've nicked from a guy called Dale Ralph Davis. He puts it like this. True faith has a driving passion for God's honor. I'll say it again because it's worth saying again. True faith has a driving passion for God's honor. And this single idea, I think, is what we see in David. And this is what we need to copy if we want to copy anything from David's life. It's this, that David's faith, the way he saw things, the way he viewed God, changed everything for him. It meant that he was passionate about God's honor. And so when he sees Goliath stand up day after day after day for almost a month and a half, every single day, throw mud at the God of Israel, every single day, laugh at the God of Israel, every single day, steal the honor of God, he can't help himself. He has to do something. Do you feel like that? You know, every day when you see on the TV or maybe in your walk of life, people throwing mud at God, people dishonoring him, do you have that sense inside you that you must do something? Maybe it's not the same as David. It's not going to be a battlefield experience, is it? But do you feel like you've got to act? I was thinking about a conversation I had ages ago with my wife, Catherine, and she was telling me about when she was a student. Uh, she studied at the Arts Uni just down the road, um, Fine Art, and she was in a lecture um, looking at uh, philosophy. It was a, a short course that she did within her studies. 
And the lecturer, uh, just as a throwaway comment, made the point that belief in God is, is pretty much the same as belief in fairies at the bottom of the garden. You heard that before? But he, he just put it out there, and, and it was left to hang, and people absorbed it. There was a little bit of laughter around the lecture theatre, and then they moved on. What do you do with that? What would you do, sitting in that lecture theatre? Now, that is just regurgitated, splurged out Richard Dawkins from The God Delusion. And if you talk to anyone serious about philosophy, they know that he's completely discredited on that count. But all the same, it, it holds some weight, doesn't it? For someone who maybe doesn't know as much, for someone who respects a person in authority, actually, that's significant. And to have a whole lecture theatre laughing at the living God, well, that's serious. And if David was there, he'd want to do something. I hope he wouldn't jump up and chop the lecturer's head off. I'm sure he wouldn't. Um, but, but what would he do? You know, I think you need to do something. It could be, as these words steal the glory of God, that you put your hand up and in a packed lecture theatre you take a risk. You say to your lecturer, I disagree with you. Maybe if you've got the guts, if you've got the knowledge, you explain why. Maybe you just leave it at that. But you take a risk. Would you feel the need to do that? David had a passion inside him for God's glory and was prepared to step out and take a risk if God's glory was at stake. It could be, I'm not going to say it's always the right scenario, it could be that instead of that you actually take him aside afterwards or ask to be taken aside afterwards and, and speak to him about your objection to what he said. You talk seriously with him, ask a question. I know John Lennox, who's a lecturer or a professor at Oxford, says that uh, people who are in positions of authority, who've worked through academia, don't like being spoken down to by their students. I can appreciate that. So maybe it's better to talk to them quietly, where their ego is not so much on display. Maybe it's that you give them a book. You don't know what to say, but you know someone's written about it, and you say, please, read this. Give it some thought. You challenge their presuppositions. Maybe you don't have a chance to do any of this, but you just do damage control. Your friends sitting around you have heard this. They've swallowed it. They're thinking about it, but you challenge them on it. You ask them what they believe. You share a bit about your own faith. But you take a risk. Any one of those things, doing them could land you up looking stupid. You could be laughed at far more than they were laughing already. You could look very silly. But for David, the risk is worth it because the honor of God is at stake. He's prepared to look incredibly stupid. In fact, he's prepared to die to protect the honor of God. Now, very rarely do any of us have to give up much to protect the honor of God. Maybe we'll look stupid, but I think it's worth it. Sometimes people's words steal God's glory. Sometimes it's lifestyles. Now, I was thinking about this. Many of us will know Christians or, or people who call themselves Christians. But if you get to know them outside of church, you realize that the way they live Monday through to Saturday, maybe even Sunday afternoons as well, doesn't match up with what they claim to believe. And as they go around with this label of Christian on them, living in complete contradiction to what the Bible talks about, about how God wants them to live, they're making statements. They're saying that whilst God is interesting, he's not all that important to me. It's saying that as they live their life, God's advice on how to live is pretty pointless. Actually, my way of living is far better. Or they're, they're saying that freedom is far more important to me than obedience to God. Now, maybe you know one of these people. What do you do about it? And we love those people, don't we? We want to see them filling our churches and growing in their faith, but maybe it means taking a difficult conversation, head on, saying to them, listen, I know how you're living and I want to challenge you. God wants you to change. But hold on a second. They might snap at you. It could be a very awkward conversation. They might not want to hear that. Their friends might stop being your friends. Yeah, they might. But God's honor is at stake. If they walk around with this label on them, claiming to be gods, but living as though they're not, I'm not saying they're perfect, or they should be. None of us will be. But if they're in defiance of him, then they're dishonoring him. And our passion for God's glory surely leads us to do something. We're like David, itching. We need to do something. Someone is dishonoring God, and something's got to be done. Now, of course, we do it with sensitivity. We do it with love. We do it with compassion. We want to see them restored just as much as we want to see God's honor restored. But we do something. So the question is, are you going to be like David? David had true faith and it had a driving passion in him for God's honor. When he saw God dishonor, he could do nothing apart from do what he could. You know, he, he stepped up, he fought the battle. And for many of us in many situations, we'll see God dishonored. And the challenge is, do we have faith like that? Do we want to see God honored enough to do something, enough to take a risk? We might look stupid. We might lose some friends along the way. But surely for the honor of God, 
the God who reigns is worth it. You know, I don't think this is just a pet talk to, to get us to be a bit like David, to fight our giants, that kind of thing. We can talk about that sort of stuff. And it sounds nice, and it's kind of a bit fluffy and feels good. But I think it's more than that. This is about the honor of God. But, you know, this passage is about David. And I guess on that day, people would have wanted to be in David's army, wouldn't they? The Israelites would have loved David after this and wanted to fight any battle with him as their king. And he would become that, wouldn't he? But this story of David points us forward to another king. Don't worry about turning there, but in Acts, Peter tells us about this future king. I'm going to read to you in Acts 2, verse 29. Peter's speaking and he says this, Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. He's just a man. He's just another king, and he lived, and he was great, and he had faith, and then he died. But... He was a prophet as well, and he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are witnesses of this fact, exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. If we skip down a bit, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. You see, David's life and all these stories we're going to hear about David point us forward to someone else, to Jesus. And as Jesus died and rose again, he won a victory far greater than David's victory against Goliath. He won a victory against sin and against death, against our ultimate um, enemies. And one day this king who reigns now at the right hand of God will return. And as a king, he will claim his victory. And he will bring about a kingdom where no more battles need to be fought, where there are no more giants to stand against the honor of God, where God is glorified and where good and right and honorability and all these things stand and where nothing opposes God or his King Jesus. And that day is coming. And so I guess as we close, there is one question I want to ask you. Are you with Jesus? He's the King. He stands. He reigns. And one day he will establish his kingdom. Let's be like David. Let's fight our battles for God's glory. But let's remember that the decisive battle is already won. And the King reigns. And one day he's coming back. Shall we pray together as we close? Father, thank you for your king, Jesus, that you have enthroned, who's raised and ascended, who is with you. Thank you that in the story of David, we catch a glimpse of his passion for your glory. We catch a glimpse of his victory over evil. We catch a glimpse of the triumph that awaits us if we join his side. Father, thank you that we are free to do that because of his grace, that this King Jesus is not a hard taskmaster, but he loves us to join his ranks. He gives us his victory. Father, please help any of us here who are far from him, who don't recognize this king. I pray that we'd see today his true kingship. We want to come close and to know him for ourselves. For those of us who stand with Jesus, help us to have the faith, the courage, the boldness to stand for your honor. Give us inside us a passion that means we cannot stay silent when people oppose you. Give us wisdom to know how to challenge them. I pray as we go out into this week that we will stand for your glory as we wait for your King Jesus. We pray all this in his name. Amen.